All right, what's up, cycling junkies? We got a good one for you today, man. What a one of my favorite dudes to talk to. Uh, before we start, let's hit sponsors. Uh, we're sponsored by Legacy Bikes. That's Legacy with an I. L E G A C I Bikes dot com. Uh, ran and operated by my man Todd. He will get your little one up on two wheels. You got Christmas not too long away. I know we aren't at Halloween yet, but you know the Christmas decorations are already coming up, and you got to start planning ahead. So get your little one a two wheel machine from Legacy Bikes. Um, we're also sponsored by Nisbra, the New York State Bicycle Racing Association. Nisbra does all the behind the scenes work in racing in New York, uh, whether it's uh, upgrades, permits, uh, calendars, grants, all kinds of really good stuff. Uh, really good, hardworking people there. So show them some love, hit them up on Facebook, check out their website for lots of good information, um, and uh, follow them at nisbra.com. All right, uh, show today is the man behind the planet Bookster Box, Steve M. Cullen. Uh, I, I love this dude, man. He's so uh, energetic and passionate and a little brash and incredibly smart and well thought out and just a lot of fun to talk to. He's a dude we could sit down and do hours and hours and hours with. Um, we had him on last uh, winter, spring, uh, somewhere in there. And uh, I actually had to miss it. I was sick, uh, so I didn't get a chance to talk to him on that episode. So I was really glad that I got to talk to him on this one. Um, he talks about the success of the Butcher Box program uh, this year, winning the team title at USA Crits. Uh, he talks a little bit about USA Cycling and some of the things he sees going on there. Uh, talks about women's racing and the future of his program with women's racing. Lots of really good stuff from Steve. So uh, check out the episode. Uh, check out his last appearance on the episode on our website. Uh, and uh, make sure you hit up his documentary, American Crit, if you haven't seen that. Um, that came out uh, last winter and uh, was a really cool show. Um, and uh, was sort of the catalyst for our first uh, first take with him. So he's always great to have on. I look forward to having him again because uh, he's just a lot of fun to talk to. And he actually recorded this one uh, from uh, a hospital room uh, after uh, a rather uh, crazy running experience, which is what we start the show with. So uh, you'll enjoy it. So check out uh, the man, Steve Cullen from Butcher Box. One, two, three, four. You'll never go out on a training ride and dig that deep. Awesome, we, we won gold. We... They're, they're life rides. I'm like, dude, I'm still figuring this out. I lose sight of the fact that it's, it's whoever goes faster. You know, this isn't a road race. This isn't a mountain bike race. The sensei of sprint, Todd Jeffy. My eyes are coming out of my head. Just get in here. Oh, so, like, so well, all right. So, like, we, we might as well just, but we're just going to get right into it, Steve. <laughs> so, like, like. Uh, yeah, always warmed up. <laughs> yeah, I mean, because, like, why are... Okay, so if anybody doesn't know, Steve is calling in from the hospital. So, Steve, give us the story, man. Like, what is going on? Yeah, well, uh, since I got out of... <laughs> so, since I got out of bikes, I, I started... To, I just started to run so much because I was on the road. And so, when you're kind of running a team, you can't... You actually don't really ride a bike that often, you know? Right. So, the easiest thing to do is, like, run, run, you know, just, just squeeze in runs or get in runs and explore this, wherever you're doing. So, I, so I run, 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 and I was like, well, marath- 5Ks and marathons are pretty cliche, so who's going to bother with that? So I was like, but ultras sound fucking stupid, so maybe I should try those. <laughs> so I started to like just make my long runs like four hours, five hours, six hours, and I was like, okay, I can do one of these as a race. So I went out and started, and then, so I started racing these, you know, some cross-country races and then ultras, and then I just did, signed up for this Mont Blanc qualifier on the weekend called this Mid-State, Mid-State Ultra, and it's this impossibly hard course. It's out of control. It's thousands and thousands and thousands of feet of climbing in the middle of the woods. And then the race not only was predicted to take, you know, 10 to 11 hours just for the 50 miler, which is the one I was doing, doing the 50 mile one, but it starts at 11 PM. So you got, so you basically run overnight. And in the middle of it, I was with the lead group where I was in the lead group through about 20 to 25 miles. And then the, a fog front rolled in in the middle of the night and, and knocked visibility down to a literal 10 feet or something like that. And so, so we were all like staggering through the fucking deep woods of central Massachusetts, (laughs) fucking falling on rocks, fucking falling on rocks. And it was like a Blair witch attack moment, Uh, you know, with everybody just blinding each other and screaming with headlamps on. And then, uh, and then, and then, uh, and then we just kept racing. And so eventually I took 
a couple wrong turns during the race, as you can see. So I, I fell out of the lead group because I took a four mile detour, chased back on running balls out until I caught them and then took another wrong t detour. And then so at the 40 mile mark, I had already run 50 something miles. And I was like, holy shit, I just have to get to the finish or I'm going to DNF. And then switched into some sort of like death march. Like, you know, I was like, human beings have done shit like this before. I can do this, you know, <laughs> it's like, and then just like made it to the finish line. But it's not like, oh, yeah, they flatten it out. It's like you still have like, like 3000 feet of easy climbing to do, you know. And so like I shuffled home in a death march and then crossed the line. And I was like, cool. OK, check that off, you know, and I was like, I can definitely win one of these things. I was pumped up. And then I was like sitting in a chair and someone was holding my face. And then I was in an ambulance. And then I was in a hospital <laughs> and then there was a whole bunch of wires attached. And I was like, don't I get my post-race beer? Like, where did everybody go? <laughs> and, then, and then they were like, they were like, yeah, your kidneys are going to fail. So you should just shut up and, and lay here. So then I was like, oh, great. So I have this stuff that I just learned. A new si the great thing about catastrophic implosions is you get all this great science education that comes with it. So I got this thing called, called rhomb rhombomyosis. Rhombomyosis, I think it is. Yeah. Okay. Ram All right. Rhombomyosis. So essentially, it's like uh, your your when you if you damage your cellular tissue so much, the muscle cells actually die and then and like dissolve and release the stuff inside your muscle cells into your bloodstream, which will overwhelm your kidneys and cause them to fail. So you basically go so hard for so long that you kill your muscles and then they poison you. And so that's what happened. So that's why. Wow. I'm Jesus right Christ. <laughs> so, so how many days ago was this? This was, this was, well, it started Saturday night. And so what is today? Monday? Monday. Yeah. Yeah. And then on top of it, it turned into some sort of cosmic punishment for shit that I did when I was younger and must, and must I'm getting like the universe is coming back at me for, because they stuck me into a room with someone with what I would call apocalyptic sleep apnea. And they were snoring at a rate that sounded like a fight. Like they were like honking and snoring and cussing and like coughing and belching all throughout the night. So it literally was like a 72 hour stretch where I went near death and then was not allowed to sleep until this morning. <laughs> <laughs> and so that's, so, and then, and then, and so now I'm okay. Now I'm fine. <laughs> So right now we have you at your best. This yeah, is it. this is the peak. 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 This is peak it. Focus, yeah. So that was what I was doing. So cool. Yeah. Wow, that. Uh, well, that's. I think that beats my weekend. I. Uh... <laughs> no, yours was better. Whatever. Trust me. Whatever the hell you did in the last seventy-two hours, it was better. Definitely I did better than the worst thing. Yeah. But, and, and, and to top it off, you still didn't even get your post-race beer. <laughs> I know. On top, I know. I'm still owed for one. Yeah. I know, it, dude. It was insane. Yeah. I but hope cool. you got a participation medal on it. So the I race director. Say. The so the race director. I, I met the race director while I was there. And I was just chit chatting because you're kind of milling around, you know, before the race, like staging for any race. And they were just talking. We just got to rap and rap and rap and talking about racing. And I was like, oh, I've been racing for 30 years. I've been racing. Blah, blah, blah. Cool. So anyway, so afterwards, he like he like emails me and he's like, hey, I was just following up to see if you're OK. And then it was also like what you did in that race yesterday was the most baller shit I've ever seen. <laughs> Hope you're doing well. Bye. <laughs> I was like, yeah, I, I was like, you know, because I was like charging through the first 20 miles. I had like a half hour lead and then and then got lost, caught back on. You know, it was like epic battle to the death and then eventually ended up in an ambulance. So he was like, <laughs> cool, don't sue me. Was, he, he, he could have just texted that, you know. Right, right, right. <laughs> I'll give you free entry fee next yeah. year. <laughs> don't tell anybody this was your experience, please. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah. Don't worry, I'm going on a podcast Monday night. Don't worry. <laughs> well, I'll call you out by name. Yeah. Uh, oh, ultimately, it was yeah. a really cool event. It was a really cool event, but whoa, it was uh, obviously what I would refer to as a 10 10 on the physically challenging scale. Yeah, yeah dudes. All right. Anyway. Yeah, that's, uh, yeah, that's definitely uh, that's definitely insane. So, dude, uh, well, I'm glad I'm glad you were able to make the podcast. Yeah, <laughs> top priority. Top priority. You know, you, you got your you got your you got your crap together soon enough for um to, to join us tonight. So that that's uh that's that's good. I mean, yeah, you still so you still pulled it together and uh and uh you're you're with us. So, well, well that's awesome, man. It's a great it'll be a great it's it's a great story already. You're not even done with it. So. Uh, <laughs> <I know. laughs> so 
but uh, but man, well you well, you weren't that bad off the last time we we talked to you, um, and you you weren't trying to do some really epic crazy running stuff, um, but you did you did have a really successful season running the butcher box team um even if you yourself weren't getting the pedals turning very often so kind of how how did you guys end up and what kind of what take us through the season a little bit here on uh looks because i mean i'm looking at results and i see i see you guys up there a lot yeah it was uh um, it was so. it was it was a great se- it was uh really it was you know i think it was definitely what we would call a season for dreamers you know i think uh it was our first full year as a team i think um, and it was a bunch of guys that some of them were from our beta program in 2018. And then it was, uh, some, basically it was a, it was a band of friends. It was all guys that I had known from racing for years that were, you know, local dudes that had something to prove or, or, ha- you know, had either, either were about to retire because they couldn't find the right opportunity or they had gotten some, you know, catastrophically disastrous European experiment, you know, that went awry. Or they just, you know, reached a stopping point in their careers where they just weren't that happy or they were young guys looking to break through. So it became kind of a, a band of brothers around people that really had something to prove. And we're very much ready to commit to each other and to a program um, to do the absolute best they can. And our team was built 100 percent on a uh, six as one philosophy, you know, that it doesn't matter who wins as long as the team does. And the guys bought into that from the from the very, very beginning. And so I think it made a very exciting story throughout the year. Um, because we went from, you know, people that are kind of, kind of everybody knew these guys cause they'd been around for a little bit, you know, and, uh, or, or they were brand new guys that were local heroes, you know, that, that people would want to see break through. So we kind of instantly had a lot of people interested in how it turned out. And, uh, you know, through a lot of tenacity and, and good communication, we started winning local races pretty quickly, um, you know, and then went on uh, a pretty significant, we racked up as a program, dozens and dozens of wins throughout the year. Uh, it was a very winning program, but our main goal was always for the best stage in the country, which is USA Crits. It's the it's the premier stage for American bike racing. It's the only show in town, in my opinion. I mean, there's lots of great races out there, absolutely. Uh, road races, and there's some stage races that are still great, and I get that, and gravel scene, all those things. But if you really want a classic sports competition, head-to-head battles, you're going to go look at, at USA Crits, and that's why we did it, is because we love the team aspect of it. So our goal was to was we said as the first year team, we wanted to win the team competition, um, which is a special type of stage race. You know, it's 10 races and it's on aggregate team points where the first four riders score. So it requires a very strategic approach to how you go out and win that thing. Um, and it also proves your ability to operate as a team and then to logistically as an organization, you know, manage a massive 10 race calendar throughout the year, you know, so it's a huge undertaking. I think the team title is is the the toughest thing to win in USA crits. I think it's the hardest thing to do. Um, And that therefore it was the most enticing for for us to go after. And so it was a real up and down battle the whole season. And we just had to improve. I had to learn how to be a better director, a better manager. The guys had to really learn how to come back from adversity. Many of them, you know, had mega breakthrough seasons. And so it was just a perfect storm of good and bad luck, frankly you know, really bad luck, which probably added to the story for spectators, but made it horrible for us. Um, and so we battled all the way through and then it all came down to basically three races at the end of the year where we had, you know, statistically an outside shot of taking the title. And, uh, you know, and obviously, uh, we did all the right things against some incredible competition and and won the title for the year. And it was, uh, you know, tears in the road, life-changing type shit, for sure, without a doubt. I mean, the best that sport has to offer. If anybody was watching, I think they saw that, you know. Yeah, and you, and you said uh, so the, the, the team aspect was something that you guys are really going for on, on USA Crits, and and may, maybe that in, 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 in my in in line with saying that USA crits and the team series that that together was really the primary goal of your season then absolutely yeah for sure yeah. i think uh yeah i think that's the future well there's a bunch of reasons uh but the main one being i think that's the future of the sport you know i think i think crit racing is a global phenomenon and it's getting near its apex right now and uh i think you know USA crits obviously there's the tour in in europe uh, you know, the, the European crit tour. And then um, there's some Kermes series that are similar, but I think the only organization I see making a real, real push outside of the, t- the European crit tour, the UK crit tour is uh, USA crits is really making a push to make it a bonafide media product that has a followable storyline with 
great media coverage, good reporting, personalities, lots of action, gets involved in the communities. You know, I think if we're going to have a sustainable model of bike racing uh, in America, I think it's going to come from USA Trits. Crits, so uh, that's why we focus on that. Yeah, can you talk a little bit about some of the things that have come about in that, you know, you think you talk about the sustainable storyline. Like that's always been one of my big criticisms of cycling in general is that whether you, you know, no matter what sort of area you're talking yeah. about, like we kind of lack that. And it's hard for your casual fans to sort of dig in and, and enjoy it um, and, and get those sort of storylines. So what kind of things are happening and what kind of things are you doing? Because you guys do a lot as a program for that as well. But what kind of yeah. things are happening on that level to bring that more into the mainstream for, for just average American sports fans who might not like cycling as much as we do? Yeah, I think I think well, there's uh, from the very top that you're either you're either a race fan or you're not, right? Like there's people that like racing and they don't care what it is, lawnmowers, drones. You know what I mean? Like like you either you either like the excitement of a head-to-head battle that comes down to the wire, or you don't. So if you're a running race fan, through the running through the fog in the middle of the night, in Massachusetts, <laughs> yes. like that kind of stuff. Right. Yeah. Also, that's exciting. Like you either you either like you either like scores, you either like points, or you like finish lines. Like that's sports, right? Or a knockout, you know what I mean? Or <laughs> something like that, you know what I mean? <laughs> right. But like, you like definitive moments. And so I think people that love racing like a definitive moment. Somebody crosses the finish line first and there it is, right? So so I think what USA Crits is doing is, you know, Crits are em- eminently watchable. They're as long as a sporting event should be, right? They're 90 minutes to two hours at max. Um, and that they're in city streets and they do laps so you can watch a lot of it. A lap format is easy to understand. People get that from automotive racing. So there's a lot about that. But USA Crit specifically has is ever improving broadcast coverage. So it's an easy subscription and they're working to get rid of the paywall on this. So so you can watch the whole race. You can watch it from your phone. You can watch it from TV. You can watch the race. And I think and they pay for photography. They pay for camera coverage. They have interviews. They do a lot to modernize the sport and make it trackable and watchable. Basically, they make it rectangle friendly, you know, and so rectangle friendly sports are the only way that they're going to survive. Um, and then there's a lot that they're doing financial incentives between they support the teams through travel logistics. They, they, they do a lot to have uh, the prize money um, be sustainable and equitable. Um, you know, so they do they do things to make it financially available. And they also provide continuity through having a series that has aggregate points with prizes that you can understand. They have enough prizes that every team has something to race for lap leaders, jersey, overall jersey, best young rider. Um, all that stuff. And, and, and then they also had the team competition, which I think is is arguably, you know, is is growing to be the more prestigious of all the titles because everybody sees how hard it is to do. It used to be one of the most overlooked titles, but I think it's it's growing in prestige. So so that's what they do. They have a series. They have a story. There's these people need to earn these things over the course of all these cities. They go to all these cool locations around America and they aggregate scores. And then each day is a race that you can follow. Right. So you can get it. So it's if you think of the USA Crit series, it's actually a re- it's it's a really spread out stage race, you know, like it aggregates over time. So it's spectator friendly, but there's a season long storyline, and they're investing media and so on and so forth. And I think more and more teams realize that a full program is a storytelling machine. So we also, you know, spend a lot of time trying to take people inside our team, um, you know, to meet the riders and follow the stories, and then you know we invest time and money in helping fans do that and get behind us on that. Yeah. And it's certainly something I've, I've held for a long time is that continuity and, uh, and Dieter Drake and I have a lot of conversations going back and forth and we have recently as well. Um, especially with the, um, the, uh, the, the Baltimore race that's come online, a uh, UCI one day next year. And I'm, mm-hmm. Um, you may have seen that come up in the news. I, I think it was not in the last 72 hours, so you're probably in the clear for yeah. seeing the news. <laughs> but, um, but uh, you know, that's it, it. In one way, it's it's a great step forward for people to stop realizing that they need to have stage races in order to make cycling sellable and yeah. and, and, and and sustainable here. But on the same on that same flip side of that coin, it's by itself. And that makes it difficult in that regard. And I think, you know, when you're looking at USA Crits, and USA Crits has been around for quite a number of years now. I'm going to say upwards of 10 years now. Oh, over uh, that. I think it's, uh, yeah, it's almost, it's in the mid-teens now. So it's pre- they're doing a pretty good job on that. Right. Because um, yeah, I always forget how many years anything's been around. Yeah, so, no, oh, it's been a couple, and then it's like, yeah, yeah I don't know. 
Um, but uh, but yeah, I mean, and, they, and they've got, and it seems like they they kind of keep just kind of keep building this steady momentum on that idea. And I always say it's it's you got to have that continuity of message so that you can get marketing dollars. Otherwise, somebody doesn't know what they're getting. And yeah. when you start having this common thread and a common theme and a and a common production level, then people are like, yeah, I'm gonna invest because I'm gonna get I'm gonna get exposure at these events, and this is what it's gonna hit. It's gonna be twenty thousand people approximately per event. It's gonna look like this. I'm you gonna got get it. This, you know, you got boom. It. And now now you've got a product to sell. Right? Yeah, that's exactly. It. I think anybody that hears the storylines, you know, I talk to people around the country all the time, much like you guys do about the sport. And I think everybody understands it. They're action packed. It's a lot of laps They they love learning about the team aspects of it and how every, all the, you know, it's like the, it's like a soccer match with all 16 teams on the field at once, you know? And they're like, Oh, I get it now. I see that all happening. So fans can learn. I think the complexity, you know, Americans were fearful that the complexity would be a barrier to the sport. And I'm like, have you ever watched American football? You know, okay. it's like, it's like, you know, people love the complexity is what makes it exciting. You know, is that there's so much to it. So, but the lap format keeps it simple and everybody gets that. And so, you know, and also it's dangerous as fuck, right? It's hella dangerous at night, super loud, you know, like it's, car, it's motorcycle fast. It's like, yeah, I mean, it's, yeah, that's, that's, that's sexy, sexy racing, you know, nighttime, you know, twilight crits are, are about as sexy as it gets in sports. So, so I think it's a great product. And I think that you said you hit it on its head with production value is the production value just has to keep going up and up and up and up and up. I think, you know, the model is there. Just just get a subscription to Red Bull TV and just look at it. You know, it's there. It's like, that's what it needs. It's like, and, and you know, truth be told, it's one great documentary series away from being coming a cult following. You know, and I, I hope, I hope personally to do that. You know what I mean? But it's, it's pretty, it's getting pretty close from uh, that the people will start paying attention on a more mass scale, you know? Yeah, I think the team aspect is, is good in that equation because, like you said, it's got to be a mix of complexity but the simplicity. And you could use football as an analogy. You could use more recently the growth of the UFC and, and the way yep. that in the beginning it was like, we just wanted to see dudes get knocked out. But then, <laughs> right, 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 it's like oh, somebody's going to yeah, get punched right. in the face, right? But yeah. then you got guys like Joe Rogan who really understand the complexity of of the chess match of the fight, yeah. and that's yeah. actually grown tremendously as as the population's gotten more educated in what they're seeing. So you still get the knockout, but you also see the complexity of the fight. And to your point about the team aspect, the team aspect is what creates that complexity in crits, right? I mean, the strategy that's going on there, which I always think is the most important part of of road racing. I think above cross racing or, or gravel right. racing or some of the other aspects of the sport. I absolutely, I couldn't agree more. I think this is why I think, I think if you compare it to like running right to, if you compare it to a marathon, uh, a similar timed event, I think people, you know, people are track and field fans. Once again, you're a racing fan or you're not, but if you think about it, it's like, it's as long as a marathon, 90 minutes to two hours or something like that, you know, comparatively. So I think, I think, you know, people watch a marathon because they're mildly interested, but mostly it's a public event, right? You go because it's marathon day and there's 100,000 people out there and your city shuts down for it. So it's an exciting community event, but you're not really a race fan. And unless you're the, the reason why marathoning is so popular, even as a spectator event, is because so many people run, right? So, so bikes can learn from that and the fact that it's accessible, but, but there's not that much that happens in a marathon from a tactical standpoint. You know, it's not as dramatic. I, I love running. I love running and I do love watching foot races. But, but there's essentially, you know, there's only a limited amount of things that really happen in a marathon. It's still dramatic. It's still amazing. I love that sport. But in bike racing, it is outrageously complicated. There's shit going on every lap for two hours. Like, so for 70 or 80 laps, the playing field changes four or five times, you know, and it's a constant, constant, violent chess match. And I think just like, and that's where it's much more comparable to soccer than it is running, is that it's a flowing battlefield of constant engagement where you're trying to create an advantage, an advantage and then something decisive happens, right? And it's about, and, and just like soccer, it's about the near misses as much as it is the goal, right? It's what almost might happen that makes it so exciting. So I think I think that's what makes crit racing just so such a thrilling thing to watch, you know? Yeah, right. when and you... at the same time with crits in, in particular, as opposed to marathons and other areas of cycling, like marathons kind of blur the line between amateur and pro and participation of the amateur athlete and the, the oh, conquering right. yeah. that and yeah. the pro end of, 
of the elite athlete, which cycling does right. a lot. And I think that's also often, often a detriment at the pro end. But when you're talking about these isolated crits, it's it's pros in these strategic battles, you know, right, out, right, out right. doing their thing. Right. It's not even yeah. a gravel race or something like that, where it's when you, you yeah, when, when an ant, when someone just walks up to the fence of a crit, no one says, oh, I could do that. Right. <laughs> There's no, they're, they're like, nope. Not for me, you know. Yeah. Like, which yeah, is usually, I'm not doing that. <laughs> yeah, it's like that's fucking stupid. Why are you guys doing that? Right. So I think I think yeah, it's an it's an immediately appreciable skill, you know, like when you watch how tight and fast those races are, which is exciting. I mean, which is which is adds to the prestige and the danger of the danger is what makes it prestigious, and that either flips a switch and you want to go through the ranks and become a pro crit racer, or you're like fuck no. But I think much like people can be soccer fans and never play soccer, I think, you know, I think I think you just have to look at we still have a long way to go to convert cycling fans into crit fans. You know, if you just take bikes, bikes are not doing bad. Bikes are booming. You know, okay. bikes are growing and growing and growing and growing and they're going everywhere. And there's more money in bikes now than there ever has been. Maybe there's not more money in road racing, but there's more money in bikes and there's more people on bikes, you know, and that's good for everybody. And crit racing just happens to be one of the enduring forms of cycling that is continue to grow and not shrink, you know, as, as bikes has continued to grow. I think it's got potential as a spectator sport. It's never going to be, I don't think crit racing is ever going to be as big as football or basketball. It's just, you know, racing sports, you know, maybe it could be, but it has to go under the right circumstances. I just don't, I, I just don't see a, a short path for that, but could it be, could it be as big as surfing? Absolutely. You know, it could be as big as surfing or skiing or snowboarding in terms of spectatorship and participation because, uh, because it's cool, you know what I mean? Because it's cool, and, and, and people do ride bikes, you know? Right, and when you were going through the, the series, I mean, it's a, it's a pretty, it, it's what, eight, nine races for the for the whole series? It's ten, um, it's ten, it's long. Okay, it's long. yeah, it's yeah. long, and it's and it's fairly spread out um, when you when you yep. kind of look at the geographic yep. um, portion of that. Um, the hard part, but also from an interesting standpoint of how did you see uh, spectatorship and production across the, the, kind of the spectrum oh, of, of venues? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. So, so um, you know, I don't want to be too harsh on them, but uh, there was there is a there is the the professionalism of how the events were run were top were top notch. Let's put it that way. They ran on time. Um, they weren't, they ran on time and they were, they ran on schedule. And I would say 90% of the time, I think they were conducted perfectly, you know, 90% of the time. Um, I think there was a few times where courses might've been better managed and there's a couple things there, there's a couple things in there, but I think it's 90% towards perfect, you know, which is pretty good considering it stretches across cities and you're building, you're building sports venues, you know, you're building a sports venue every weekend you know that's yeah. how is how it works so right. so it's pretty good you know the fact that you know so so you know i give it i give it right now i give it a uh, a solid in the grand scheme like a solid b plus you know well worth your time to invest in as a as a business and as a team um but it's got steps to go before it gets to a plus i think the broadcast has to come up you know two or three levels you know before it's really as as excellent as broadcasting can be and then I think the production values of the race are solid, but could be just a little bit better. And I know Scott Morris is working towards that. And then I think the overall engagement from the cities um, could be a few levels better. I think some communities really have it, but some communities are still, you know, centralizing the, ra the race as a major community event. So, like I said, B plus, well worth your time, but there's obvious levels to go, obvious levels. Right. In right. that in that production value, is it a, a detriment that USA Cycling is kind of working with all these independent contractors oh, to put these together? Man, you had <laughs> like, to say it, didn't you? You yeah. had to say it. So here's the big issue, right? So this is the big uh, I have friends that work for USA Cycling and there are a ton of people trying to do the, the right thing in there. I personally think that there's a significant amount of that organization that is forty years behind contemporary sport. You know, like like a complete a complete lack of understanding of what modern sport is. And I'm not saying that's every person. I definitely have friends that work there and that do understand bike racing and, and, and what makes great sport. But US, USA Cycling just is is confusing is confusing at best sometimes. Mm -hmm. I think what I think, what I think, and, and like their investment, their investment in what stories they're telling doesn't make any sense. 
Like they spend so much money on things that do not fucking matter. And it's just like, it's just, I, yeah. So, so I think they just, I, it, it strikes me as an organization overwhelmed with responsibilities and it doesn't know what to focus on. And so it, it's throwing cash around at things that are just not doing it. It's great. And I, I have broadcasters and advocates and I have friends within that organization, but I think it needs a massive overhaul at the leadership level and someone who really understands brand building to take over that thing and make it relevant again, you know? And well, if it's it supposed really... to be a, go ahead, sorry. No, oh, no, I, I want you to continue. I, I guess right along those lines, I kind of wonder, is it the role of a uh entity like that was USA my next cycling time. to develop yeah. the pro end like there usa basketball my... is not the nba isn't run by usa basketball right you, <laughs> you know so what i mean exactly like they're it. No, they have different it. jobs it. right that's exactly it i dude you're killing it yes so that's exactly <laughs> what i'm saying is that like right now it's between like grassroots community and promoting bicycle activity and also trying to be a pipeline to the olympics and world championships right. you know what i mean it's like it's like it's it's somewhere between a national governing body and an advocacy group, it's like, it's split, you know, like, like Australian national program is focused on medals, right? Like that's all it does. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's got one goal. If it's got a medal, we go for it, you know? So that means it goes from straight to, it's like, it's clearly focused on what it does. And then it leaves everything else. I think USAC is spread, spread, you know, USA cycling is spread across so many things. I exactly agree. I think they should get the hell out of the race promotion game entirely, unless I'm completely confused. You know, and then I think it's going to be a future where that's why I think U.S. It's, it's going to take a private entity like USA Crits to really grow. Right. But right now, it almost seems like it's competing with USAC to form a league and to get viewership instead of getting support from it. Right. So so, I, you know, I'm not I'm not as privy to the interior, but like I just I just think with the resources that I see USAC using to promote things that aren't as relevant versus what I see. USA Crits doing with n no resources for the sport of American cycling. It just seems like they're in opposition half the time. Right. And, and when you say, you know, the example, like when you say like, um, you spend money in the wrong space, wh wh like where do you see the, uh, uh, like a, a shiny uh, example well, of uh, why do they spend money on? I put you on the spot. Yeah, you know, I, <laughs> There's so many. <laughs> no, Where no, do I you know choose? no, no, it's because it's because I know that there's well-intentioned people. And I also don't want to get into a thing where I'm saying, uh, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to, yeah, I'm going to have to lightly punt that one because, but I do think mm, that one's challenging. For, that one's challenging. That one's just challenging for me because I, I let me, I got to think of how to say that. I have to say that I, I wish that they would be putting, I wish that they would be putting coverage on events that had greater community impact or were, and, and were telling that story better. That's all I can really say. Right. I don't think that USAC is investing its energies in the most compelling performance arenas, nor is it telling the best stories about those performances with the resources that they have. And I know that's a very, narrow way to say that but like uh. and, and, I'll, and i'll say like kind of going along I, i'll put myself out there because i i probably have less to lose um, <laughs> so, but but it's, when i when i when i see the and, and i and i've really been torn in the last couple of weeks on this because right about the time i heard hey we're really gonna bump up this ride with us campaign thing to get membership in usa cycling as a participatory get a license and ride with a like which i can't figure okay. out what yeah. the point is and then we turn around like literally weeks later and we have the most crushing world championships we've had in a generation and yeah. and i see hardly about it and yeah. you know i mean i see some stuff on the cycling publications but but outside of that it's like it never happened i'm like how are we not like if this isn't the time to get it out there when is and we're worried about ride with us how about race with us yeah, so that's exactly it. So you're either going to say that no, oh. this is this is my point and well said. It's like they got to, uh, you know, I, I want to be. I don't know. I haven't researched. Let me say it this way. This is this is a loosely informed opinion, loosely informed. You know, I haven't done the research on knowing exactly what USAC's charter is, and I probably should as someone that's deeply involved in the sport. I haven't really looked at the broader context of the governing bodies outside of that. Every year I really, I read the rule book every year. That's what I do. You know what I mean? So, so I haven't gone super deep on, on what, 
what we, what the uh, you know uh, what their charter is, but it's either going to be as performance development, and then they create a moon mission, right? To return, they create a moon mission that's a call to arms for America to push to its greatest heights it ever has in two wheeled sport, right? Mm-hmm. And so, and then it's going to say, yeah, it's it's race with us, right? Or it's going to say it's 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 just a powerful bicycling advocacy group, and then it's ride with us, right? Right. And, and, and then, and then it's all about supporting clubs and supporting ride groups and bicycle friendly cities. And it creates like its own factory team. Right. And you can join it as a club and it's a resource and it creates it like a social media community. Right. So it, it follows a CrossFit model or it follows, uh, or, or it does, or it partners with Strava, you know, like it thinks much more in a community development way and creates membership levels and supports and it makes it a huge Rafa cycling club. Right. Like it does something like that to either institutionalize and support and grow the nature of bike riding. But if it's performance orientated, then it's got to either be about, you know, raising the ele- or if it's about performance, then it's got to be about elevating Americans performance standards, in which case it has to pick what those standards are to measure them against medals or whatever. Right. right. Or I would argue or I would argue developing the future of the sport, which would be crit racing, fixed gear racing, gravel. And frankly, Here's where the puck's heading is adventure racing. Adventure racing is the new gravel racing. In three years, things like the Silk Road race are going to be what the fuck is it all? It's all about anyways. You know what I mean? So, so, so I just don't get a sense of what its mission is. And I think that's also what you're saying is like, I, I, which goes back to what you and I were just saying a few seconds ago is I just feel like it needs to do like a bit of a reset and decide what it needs to achieve in the next five years. It, it just, I just don't get a sense of it, you know, right, right now. No, and I don't, and it's and it's and it's hard for you know I, coming from so many years of, of of racing and you know remembering back. So when you talk about you know um, you know basically saying like you know USA basketball is not uh, is not the NBA, and you're saying yeah, and we, we split those off, and it's like yeah, I remember when it was US Pro and United States Cycling Federation, which is why we still call them the Feds. Anybody that's old enough to be around, um, <laughs> you no, know, but it's like, but it was it was US Pro was separate um, mm-hmm. as an organization. Now they didn't take off, but I don't think they have the momentum that uh, USA Crits. Because this is back in the '80s, and things were different in the '70s and '80s. I mean, we've you know everything's evolved. Yeah. But but yeah. when I hear "ride with us," I'm thinking you've lost your way. When on the one hand you you're you're winning everything at world championships and you have this generation coming up that are bike racers and i got juniors interested in bike racing right now i got a couple of kids that are like i want to race bikes man they're psyched right right and i'm right. like and then here i got a found and, and here on the other hand we have we have a federation or not a federation anymore the usa cycling as an organization i should say stumbling to find its way yeah. and it seems I, like this couldn't be more different I know. Um, it, I, I just, you know? especially, especially with the, with the rise of, with, with the long overdue rise of the women's side of the sport. And I would say, the, yeah, you know, absolutely. women, women's sports and women's sport in general has, you know, after a couple of generations of, of serious activism is now at, you know, a, a major breakthrough moment where you're seeing, you know, you know, all the way from Serena to Chloe Diger, you know, you're just seeing like these epic figures, you know, of all different ages and ethnicities that, are entrepreneurial and in leadership positions. So, you know, I mean, everybody's read Abby Wambach's book, you know, it's like, it's so, so it's like, so you just have like the idea of iconic, powerful alpha female athletes is now part of society and our highest performing people on two wheels are women, right. You know, in America. So it's like, okay, (laughs) like if, if anything, just, just go after, you know, young, I would just go after female girls and just say, you know, like, like I would go after young girls that you're 12 to 18 years old and say, you know, be the next generation of alpha competitors. That would be an amazing mission. You know, like that would be an amazing mission for USAC that would PS draw in male cyclists. You know what I mean? That would want to be part of a Mm -hmm. big movement like that. I mean, everybody wants to go to the moon, right? Everybody wants to go to the moon. They don't care what gender it is. So if you're like, no, we're going to be the best female cycling country in the fucking planet. And we are going to take home more Olympic and world medals in the next decade than any country has ever done before. You would get high schools sponsoring cycling teams. You know what I mean? You would have high school racing teams. Like you, it would just, you know what I mean? It would, it would just do all of that. And cycling could become what soccer was for women. You know, it, it was like their white space 
to be the alpha leadership portion of of professional sport you know it's like it's the thing that girls did is they went to soccer that's where their icons were or tennis you know that's where their icons were well now it could be cycling you know so right. i agree with you that that's a huge opportunity and again it's back to the same thing it's just like pick a goal and then go after it you know i would right. support usac 100 percent. besides paying for my license if they were like we're out to dominate women's cycling i'm like here is 500 dollars. go get them <laughs> you know right right yeah but it's just a, such a fractured thing right now and uh you know and it's hard to it's hard to see when it's just stomping it out there on international stage and there's really not and, and we see a we see a decrease here in opportunities and hopefully increase in usa crits um yeah. and you know well, and USA, being given you know, stage oh my for God. yeah competing for, well let's also say this that 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 so this year so in talking about and talking about things that I maybe maybe know more about, <laughs> which is running, which is running a crit team, <laughs> um, you know, this year. Well, these are, yeah, I was like, I'm not as versed on some of these bits, but, uh, you know, when it comes to running a crit team, it's a thing I know a bit about at this time. And so in 2020, we're going to be launching a women's team. Uh, we had a successful beta program this year that had a bunch of women from the UK, um, you know, from the UK and around the US, friends of mine, and then also some new women and, and also from Australia. Um, and mm -hmm. we put on like a three month beta program. And so I was like, okay, ladies go out and prove that we can do all this. And then I'll go out and build that team. And, and then our team is expanding our roster. And Mike Salguero from Butcher Box is a big believer in obviously all natural support. And so that's why he's a title sponsor for our team, um, and it's health mission. And, uh, so he's, you know, really invested in building up a professional women's program where, uh, where, where we, you know, our men's and women's budgets are 100% equal, um, you know, between both of the programs, they're supported at a significant level. It could always be, you know, a touch higher, you know, it's not as good as soccer or anything like that, but it's enough that, you know, it's getting it to a level where people can start really focusing on the racing and doing the advocacy work that professional athletes should be doing. Um, and, and, and I can say that is because of USA crits specifically, right. you know, specifically because I have a stage mm -hmm. in which I can, I can display their message, you know? And right. so it, it allows me to provide continuity and story for my clients. And I can say, Hey, we're going to go out and advocate for these things. So yes, we're going to do community rides. We're going to give talks to school children. We're going to, um, you know, we're going to do all this stuff and to tie all that together. We have this epic story that we're demonstrating the, the benefits of healthy living at the highest level we can, which is something sexy and dangerous and glamorous like crit racing. And so it gives a continuity to the year that allows us to go to all these communities, talk to people, do rides, meet people, share our stories with them, right? And so that continuity is what allows me to build a team because we have market value for people that want to participate in this athletic community, right? Which has allowed me to, through a successful men's program, re, you know, up the level of support for my men's program and add, it's, there's no economies of scale, by the way. Everybody knows that. You don't, you don't get one, you don't get two teams for the price of one, right? So right. basically double the team by adding on a women's program and that's strictly because of the continuity between USA Crits and, and also how we operate ourselves as a team. But we can do that because of that it makes business sense in that way. And then I can tell you right now that, you know, there is there is a lot of money flowing into women's cycling. I mean, like it is incredibly competitive recruiting in women's cycling, incredibly competitive. Good. It is outrageous. Yeah. On the men's side, I could build this is no no bullshit. I could build three championship winning teams with the resumes I have sitting in my inbox. Like they're all so goddamn fast. Everybody that I like, everybody's so fast and there's just not as many programs out there. And so, and you know, I'm loyal to my guys, so I would never replace them for any reason unless they got a really bad haircut. No, I'd even take them for that. <laughs> but no, no, I'd probably want them to do that. But for the women's side, it's like, I, you know, I, for the women's side, I, I'm super fortunate to have my core, my core ladies, but like, you know, we just made a couple really, really competitive signings, like exceptionally competitive signings where this young talent, there's a young sprinter talent that, um, that I, you know, I've been talking to all year and, and, you know, as she got better, I was like, okay, you're ready for the program this year. She was sitting on four, four contracts in her inbox, sitting on them, waiting and saying, okay, I'm going to wait for you to put together your offer to see how that works. Cause I want to race with your program. But that's madness, right? Like, that's crazy. And that's not the only story like that. She's particularly talented. But, like, all the women I talked to had three to four options at all times. 
you know, yeah, I would. Uh, how does yeah. how is crits how how are crits uh, stacking up in terms of the sport across for, so, for women? Because what a smart cause, question. Because yes. you got so, cross track yes. gravel and mountain right. bike where women are killing it. Dude, like so there's huge names there, I know, right? I know. So where now are you? I know, where are you dude. getting them? This is the exciting part because this is so. This is so much. The, this is what's so exciting about this sport right now because it's exploding all over the place. I, it just makes me want to like pass out when I hear people like, "Oh, bikes are dying." I'm like, "You are an <laughs> idiot. Are you watching what's going on? It's never been more exciting." Right. You know, for a hundred years, bikes were about going up a mountain in the middle of Europe, and now <laughs> they're about doing anything anywhere with every gender and ethnicity on the planet. Like, it is such an exciting time for bikes, you know. And the women's side is what's really booming it in so many ways. So. To your question, which is, what's the role of crits? It's really interesting that you mentioned that because, because there's not at the, at the world tour level, which is still an incredible standard, which is still an incredible standard, no disparity to that. It's an incredible standard at the world tour because there's not absolute gender parity. This is my belief because there's not absolute gender parity and there is no women's tour to France. That's three weeks long, right? There's no women's Giro. That's three weeks long. Right. Because it doesn't have exact parity or equivalent. I wouldn't want I don't want to say parity because parity is not always good. Right. You know, but like equivalent, you know, that doesn't have the female equivalent. I think there's a massive amount of trajectory uh, amongst young female cyclists to continue to push towards that. So the trickle down effect is many talented young female cyclists want to be excellent stage racers, you know, like because they view that as part of a broader global movement to move bikes towards um, complete gender parity, uh, equity at the world tour level. This is my belief in talking to being pretty deeply rooted in recruiting and talking to bike racing women across the country. And you are either a crit dog and you love the speed, right? And you're like, I love the crit scene. I love the rock and roll lifestyle. I love the late nights. I love the danger. Give me the dark. Give me the speed. <laughs> or, right, and you're just wired that way. You're just wired that way. But, and then there's the exact split on the other side, which is like, no, I want the traditional path because I still haven't gotten my share of it. You know, like I still haven't gotten my, 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 my version of what that is. So the women that I really was interested in signing this year, the women that I was really interested in signing this year, when I wasn't able to close the deal on them, it's because 100% went to stage racing teams. They wanted that. You know what I mean? That's what they wanted to focus on. And the Tour of Colorado, which I have a lot of opinions on, but the Tour of Colorado is an incredibly enticing stage for a lot of women. Mm -hmm. You know, they see that. They see that. And I think that's good for the sport. But it's interesting because... Because I think there's a significant amount of top talent that is pursuing world, world tour dreams, you know, and uh, in a way that I think men's cycling is not because I think that hierarchy is pretty stacked, right? Like, like there's a path, there, there's just the roads are all paved in bike racing for, 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 for guys, but I think for women, they're still paving roads. And so I, I think, I think it's uh I think stage racing is still playing a big part in it. And I, it's interesting. I might, I, I might even, you know, I've, I've even been talking about it with my co-owner, Steve Ramirez, about maybe in 21 changing our team, you know, our, our brand strategy around women's racing to incorporate more stage racing. It's not that we're anti-stage racing. We're just pro future, you know? Mm -hmm. So, you know, we're, we, we, we want to put on a gravel team. We want to put on a fixed gear team and we want to put on an adventure team. These things are in our charter. You know, like they're sitting there waiting to be acted on as soon as we can get the time and money to go do it. And for our women, I don't know if the women's program is really successful and people love it and follow the story. I would be interested in seeing what would what a true uh, a, a, what a what a women's calendar that supports the best in female orientated events. Um, you know, th that might not be the best way to say it, but that that highlights where the best female talent is would look like. And I bet you it's going to include some stage racing in there. So, so it's interesting. It, it, I, I don't know how much different that calendar would look like than what Superman's calendar looked like last year. So, so I can't tell. I, I, I don't know. I haven't analyzed it really. I, I still tend to believe that it's going to be crits and gravel racing ever before it's stage racing, but it just seems like so much of the talent in that, in, on the women's side of the sport wants to stage race. So 
And if they don't want to stage race, yeah, anyways, I could keep going on that particular topic, but it's super interesting because I'm just starting to see that particular trend. And it's really astute that you, that you noted that. Well, this is, I think we, man, we hit a ton of stuff here. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and, and I might, and hopefully I didn't even get you in trouble. Um, <laughs> but uh, I'm obviously, obviously a little, a little freer to speak about where I think the, 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 the national organization is going, but, uh, but I think it's, it, it is interesting to see where the, the women's side of things is, is heading. Um, and I think, you know, when I look at it for sure, and I ran a women's team for a while as well. And I think mm. a lot of that comes from just, what has already been there, right? People often, they, they're aspiring to what has been. Um, mm-hmm. And they're saying, that's always been the, you know, it's why did, why did, why didn't the U.S. they keep wanting to make stage races? Because that's supposed to be the pinnacle, right? It's supposed to be, yeah. when you're doing a stage yeah. race, that's, that's when your event has grown up, right? And it was always right. like, no, why can't a crit just be its own crit? Why couldn't, yeah. why can't a one day road race be an epic one day road race? I mean, Dieter built, you know, bat and kill. He, he started gravel when nobody he was doing right. gravel right and and he right. made it a one day race and and you know and i think people are kind of patterning that and saying yeah that's that's the pinnacle and i think maybe people start to kind of maybe, maybe it's a mix of gravel and it's a, it's crits and it's it's these things that we can market and that becomes what to aspire to is doing the being fast and, and having these really high energy events and people stop having to say like yeah if i'm not racing up a mountain it, it it's still really cool and it that's not necessarily yeah. the, the top of the sport and i think you even see it with our our two uh our two uh, juniors who are gold and bronze medalists at this year's world championships their their long plan is classics yeah right right, right yeah you know? well well simmons quinn's long plan is classics i don't know if magnus is quite on board with that well, um, it's, i mean it's still yeah and and, and arguably he he's he's a greg lamont kind of rider i mean yeah. and it's he can he'll pretty I mean, and Lamont was a could go anywhere kind of rider. I mean, he could do a he could do a one day classic and obviously win a three week stage race. And uh, you know, Magnus I think is definitely in that fits that 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 phenotype and that but I, uh, I do yeah. think we're seeing that from a lot of uh, upcoming riders whether they're talking about Magnus or some of the the big women's names in the sport is kind of a lot more riders going, you know what, I can do kind of everything. I can do cross, I can yeah. do mountain. I could do crit. I could do track. Like I want to prove that racing a bike is sort of, you know, it's it's all encompassing. It's not just the big stage yeah. races or not well, just yeah, being a at, crit racer. Look at PFP, like PFP was doing that. You know what I mean? And so when she does, you know, you just get. I mean, Vanderpool is, is might be one of the few guys that can pull off something as outrageous as that. But in the women's side of the sport, starting with Voss, right? Mm-hmm. that's how they almost had to make a living is they needed to collect contracts year round. Right. So what right. used to came, come out of necessity is these poor ladies had to fucking bury themselves, you know, 20 months in a row until like Mariana Voss, they get so sick, they lose a year. You know what I mean? It's like, it's like they had to do these insane things, but now you're seeing these multi-talented women that are figu- figuring out how to stitch it together between multiple genres. And now guys like Vanderpool are starting to follow that model. But, Yeah, I think it's more interesting than that. That's the whole point. I'm so with you guys. I think it's so much more interesting. There's so many more ways to go in the sport now. I mean, without a doubt, by 21, there's going to be a national gravel calendar. Do you know what I mean? Like, no doubt. Sure. You know, like, 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 if it's not being worked on right now, anybody that's listening, you're a fool. Do it. (laughs) You know, it's like, it's like, obviously, there's. Although I love to wait for the for the blowback from all the gravel purists on that about how that'll destroy the sport. (laughs) You know, you can't have a national calendar and you can't have all this competition because it's not supposed to be competitive. But but I think you're right. And I think it will happen. You know, it's the same people who said, you know, Ted King was going to kill dirty Kansas and, you know, arrow bars were going to kill dirty Kansas. You know, it's that same attitude and you'll get it with the national calendar and then it won't. But yeah, uh, right. Right, yeah, right, right, right. Yeah, there's, there's well, hey, I look at it this way. If if you can have an e, if you can have an esports national championships and <laughs> in, in worlds, you can well, definitely have gravel. <laughs> well, I've been in talks. I know I've been talking. I've been you know I've been talking uh, legitimate real talks, like button up shirt, sit down at a big wooden table, talks about how to get crit racing into the Olympics in 28. You know, like what are the steps? Right. you know that that go into that and it's just you know the, i mean because the big challenge on getting stuff into the olympics you know to 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 elevate to elevate the status of that particular thing is like you know it's all about it's all a battle for beds right they build a village it's got twenty thousand beds there you go and then right. it's an eight-year battle to earn a bed that's what that's what the olympics are 
you know, and in the Olympic Committee has a, has an arbitrary and 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 absolute power. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Right. Right. So so like look what they did to wrestling. Right. Wrestling was this antiquated, fucked up backwater management system, and they literally kicked wrestling out of the Olympics for a year. You know, right. they were like, if you don't get your shit together, you're gone. <laughs> and then they were like, oh, fuck you. And then they just punted wrestling for crying out loud, like the original sport. Right, so, right. you know, they, so, so, you know, that just goes to show it's all about proving to them that your sport is operating at a high enough level and can provide Olympic level talent across multiple nations to put on a spectator event worthy of the world's most congruent sporting event. Right. So, you know, and so, so I think, I think a measure, I think I bring that up because I think, I think putting things into calendars with standards adds a level of prestige that that gravitates that is that has a gravitational pull to audiences right so so if gravel you know like i I think i think a national calendar i think you know crit racing is in the olympics it would add prestige and and followership and and interest into a nation you know of, of crit racers right i think and in the same way i think like a national calendar around gravel racing um, you know, isn't going to ruin gravel racing. It's just going to elevate the standards and add prestige with, with ads cachet. And what it would just do is it would just spark more bandit gravel events, right? Just like it did in running, right? Like with running crews, where running crews and running clubs were the alternate to running in track teams. And right, then they were take the bridge movement and there were all these other movements. It just sparks underground movements within that culture, but it grows the culture and ultimately makes the training and the communities and the support and the equipment better, you know, like it makes the whole sport better. So that, you know, it's just that, yeah, maybe dirty cans is going to be a huge thing now. It wasn't the backwater thing that it was when it started. Yeah, of course. Right. So, Definitely. You know. All right. So I got, I got one more question yeah, question, you... question for you. Tell me about the cowboy hats, man. What's, what's the deal? <laughs> I love yeah, it. Well... Tell me about it. What do, and I want, I want one with the says butcher box on it. Like I want Dude, butcher box branded this, cowboy hats. The amount, year. the amount of people that now wear cowboy hats at crit races is lightly dis is, is awesome and disconcerting <laughs> because, <laughs> because, 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 because we don't have any real symbolism behind it. <laughs> and then, and then, Oh the, the, yeah. And then the, the amount of backlash and mockery that we get is also off the charts. Right. Uh, but it's straight up. I think, I think, you know, it started off, uh, it was actually Connor Saley, uh, our road captain on the men's team was the first to do it, but I think it's all literally the cowboy lifestyle. Right. It's, it's, you know, it's riding out in the open range and like freewheeling, freedom loving lifestyle is what it was all about. And so it was kind of an ironic gesture when it started. But like, I guess there's a level of truth to the outlaw lifestyle that that my guy, my guys are particularly rowdy. So, uh, <laughs> so, so it's starting off, but they're all like no bullshit real Stetsons. Like nice. all of them cost like two hundred to three hundred dollars, which freaked right. us the fuck out when we bought them. We're right. like, "Oh, that's a nice one." <laughs> and then we walked up and like set it down on the table, and like that'll be two fifty five. And I remember looking over at John Harris, and he's like, <laughs> he just shrugged at me. He's like, "I need to win." <laughs> he's, like, he's, like, he's like, "I'm going for that preem, homie." <laughs> gotta, gotta, gotta have. If you want to eat tomorrow, we're gonna win now. <laughs> Hats of food, and he's like, "I want both." <laughs> that's right so so it's not a, so it's not an american flyers thing that you guys are are picking up on here no right? isn't that crazy right no no that came way later when people would like post so people would post our team photos and those photos together and i was like oh shit i didn't even think of that no I was like, connor and john harris connor and john harris were just like yep went and did that and yep. then uh and then i think it's just you know i think we just all embraced the all the things that cowboys embrace that freedom loving quick draw lifestyle. Uh, and it was pretty fun, you know, but then it became a thing. And then also now I just wear a cowboy hat, which is weird, but awesome. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> It well, is awesome, and, man. It's awesome. I love it. Well, I'm hoping that <laughs> I'm, I'm hoping in May or June, the first weekend of June next year, you're here in Rochester with your, with your cowboy hat. Yeah. I hope we, well, the Rochester twilight is, uh, is a fantastic race course, man. It is. It is a truly epic race course. I mean, two bridges. It's got great high speed technical turns. That 180 is awesome. It's got like a reset on the backside, but plenty of action on the front side. It's just like, it's just a great racing course. It's just a really great racing course. It is. Um, and, uh, and I've never known anybody that's done that race that hasn't been like, wow, that was fucking awesome. I think, you know, I think the challenge is just our guys, our guys' time 
our guy and our girls team, like our program's time is really limited. You know, it's just, it's so focused on the calendar and preparing for the calendar that it's difficult for us to get to certain races. We had four guys went up there last year. And so we'll try, we'll try to do more. We'll try to do more of it because that's a high quality race. And it was, um, you know, and it had good prize money, which is, which is important to my guys. You know, it's not, it's not bullshit for the, for the pros. That's real. That's real stuff. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. And, you, and you guys got to be hungry because uh, Connor was second last year and, and Sam was yeah. fourth. So you guys, you guys were, you guys were nipping at that, that, that top spot. So I mean, Connor's got to be feeling hungry. So, so I'm just yeah. planting the seeds here. See, I'm planting the seeds here. <laughs> yeah. No, it's good. I think, yeah, Connor had, I mean, you know, I think, I think all those guys came to a new level this year and Connor's obviously, uh, Con- Connor's, Connor is, uh, he's kind of his own unit, man. He's a, he's like, he's from a different era. He's like a black and white photo bike racer. He's just a really, really ice cold competitor. Uh, he's going to be better next year. You know, he's going to be maturing even more. And I think he's got so much more confidence from this year, but he just, he doesn't make as the year went on by the end of the year, he just didn't make mistakes anymore. Like he just was a textbook. Like if you want to know how to race crits, like you should definitely watch Connor Saley. Like he's, pretty perfect now we're just going to work on refinements within the team with him you know and maybe he'll get one percent fitter next year you know what i mean like he'll just get that little bit more fit um but i think his mental game he's gonna he's gonna start well all my guys are gonna start the year what we always said is that we said we said when we went to gateway cup we said that's the start of 2020 like we've already started 2020 you know so we're gonna come in on all cylinders next year um and and you're gonna see you're going to see some real magic from from my guys, but you're going to see some real magic from Connor Saley for sure. Next well, year. cool, and I'm and I'm I'm equally as excited to uh, to see some some of the magic from the uh, the women's side too. And I yeah, think that's I very cannot exciting. wait so, to announce my roster. So bring it, so wait. bring it, man. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> when you're when you're ready to announce your roster, hit us up. We'll do this again. This is a lot of fun, yeah. man. Yeah, it was a blast. Thank you so much. Yeah, I, I'm only I'm like a couple signings away from being done, and we'll we'll do that. But uh. But yeah, awesome. my ladies are my ladies are uh, they're all kind of savages too. So I have my Sweet. hands full with twelve of them. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. When it's yeah. when it's ready, hit us up and we'll get one or two of them on and, and we'll do it again. Oh, That'll be great, best. man. They're the best. Yeah. Thanks cool. so much, awesome. man. I really appreciate it. All right, it. thank you. Get well, right. man. Yeah, feel better. <laughs> Jeez. Zero point <laughs> zero. So Stay out yeah. of the fog. All right. <laughs> well, thanks, guys. Take care, man. Yeah. Yeah.